Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. Alex, you're here! Hi! I've missed you for so long. <laughs> well, be being sick does that. I had to invite guests on so that I didn't feel so lonesome the last few few times. They all send their best regards, by the way. Oh, good. Well, yes. it worked. It worked, and now you're, you're all better. Do you feel like going on an adventure today? Uh, yes. Perfect. Well, good news. Now that you're back and ready to go on an adventure, we get to talk a little bit about D&D Adventures League on the show today. And who better to talk to than one of the resource managers for D&D Adventures League, Alan Patrick. Alan, thank you for being on the show. Hey, happy to be here. Yes, um, uh, thank you so for much for being on. Um, AL is not necessarily a format that we're familiar with personally. We haven't been able to play in it, uh, which is why we wanted to know a little bit more. Uh, but before we get into that, I was just wondering if we could uh, just learn just a little bit about you, how you got involved with Adventures League, uh, you know, how you got drawn to the format, uh, how you got introduced to it. Okay. Uh, it is a tangled, weird path. Uh, it is it is a very convoluted road, but you know what? Mixed metaphors aside, um, <laughs> I actually like as a kid, I wasn't allowed to get into any of these games. Right? Like it right. was uh, the eighties were a very different culture, <laughs> and uh, uh, I I did some Dungeon Dragon stuff with friends. Uh, organized play was at the time it was taking place uh, as they got into like the nineties, early two thousands. It was all at the uh, in like the convention level, so I didn't get a ton of experience and exposure to it. Finally, saved my pennies and uh, made it to Gen Con a couple of times. Got uh, just got friendly with some of the the people that I saw there. Right, it's it's an incredibly yeah. social circle. Uh, eventually, I was asked to consider uh, writing a couple of ventures for Fourth Edition D and D. I wrote a dozen or so there, and as Fifth Edition was coming around. Uh, Wizards had said, hey, we're going to be talking to some people. We have this open application process. And uh, long story short, I put in a resume. A few weeks later, they called and said, do you, do you want this job? It doesn't pay well, but it's really super nerdy <laughs> and cool. And we have a lot of hope for how it's going to grow. And mm -hmm. uh, well, here we are. Yeah. That's, so you were, uh, you were in it from pretty early on then. From pre day one, yes. Pre day one. Oh, okay, excellent. Very nice. Uh, so now, did that start with fourth edition, or did that really start with fifth? So my administration uh, experience started with the fifth edition release. So the oh, six okay. months or so prior was us setting up the program and such. For fourth edition, uh, I didn't do any admin work, but I did write and contribute adventures and story concepts. Uh, so Adventures League started in fourth edition, though. It, adventures League is a fifth edition product. Oh, it, okay, it, so it's yeah. only been in 5th edition. Okay, great. Now, 4th edition, was that the first time that you had played, or did you play earlier versions before you got introduced to them? Uh, I had played a little bit before, as far as okay. organized play stuff goes. Uh, sure. In 3.5, there was an Eberron campaign called Zendrick Expedition that was available for stores and was encouraged for stores to use. So oh. not as much focus on a convention play, more for stores and home, and that's what really got me. Just in general, just wide swath. Um, how does Adventures League work? Uh, wide swath? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, wide just swath, wide. apparently. Nathan just wants, like, a basic, like, yeah, what's yeah. the deal with Adventure League, I guess? <laughs> what's the deal? Yeah. So, what, what's up with that? What's uh, up? So, Adventures League is, the, in, the intention of it is to have a standardized set of expectations. And I, I don't want to say standardized experience because every DM, every player is going to interpret the content a little bit differently, right? Sure. And we want to provide the tools for DMs and players to really own the content. But by providing a standardized expectation, uh, such as player's handbook plus one resource for your character creation and uh, allowing or disallowing certain uh, variant optional rules uh, in the core rule books, uh, in you know, flagging content as it's released from wizards as being program eligible or not or maybe it's program eligible notes mm -hmm. that way we can we can provide a common foundation from which players and dms can build their interpreted experience does that does that kind of make sense yeah 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 that does that's actually a good jumping off point because yeah. um i was i was kind of wondering how how do you find out what is al legal what are what are criteria for determining adventures league legal content 
on which side, like the player side or on like the deciding factor for Adventure League side, Nathan? Yes. <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> no that's, that's good. I think that's, I think that is a totally valid question and it's, it's simpler than you might think okay. in a general sense. If it's published by Wizards of the Coast directly, it is almost certainly going to be in the program. If not fully, then in some major capacity. And by that, uh, I want to call out a, an element from our current adventure, the okay. Baldur's Gate Descent and Avernus. It's a huge, sprawling adventure. The characters start in the, you know, the villainous city of Baldur's Gate. They end up going to Avernus, like one of the layers in the Nine Hell. And in it, there are some really cool NPCs, but there are also some new and really cool items. Now, the book is produced by Wizards of the Coast. It's published by Wizards. It's written by the Wizards team. So we are going to do everything we can to support it. I mean, technically, we're all Wizards team members, too. So uh, it's just a good idea, right? (laughs) Uh, But let's, you know, calling out one of the items in specific is the Shield of the Hidden Lord. Um, Without giving too many spoilers, it is a legendary item, meaning it's very, very powerful. It's got its own presence in the story and is just it, it can be disruptive because of how early it's available and all the powers that it's got we've decided to not make a blanket approval for the item but we've nominated it to be what we call a story item so when your characters are playing through that story if they've already earned that item anytime they go into descent into avernus adventure they they'll have access to it now if you pull okay. your character out and you go play something from like tomb of annihilation or uh, Tyranny of Dragons, which we just recently reviewed. The, the story item from uh, Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus does not travel with them. It's waiting for them when they get back. So that's one of those modified availability things. Oh, okay. Okay. So it doesn't really translate over to the other adventure. Correct. But, it, but you did get there. It's central to the story. It's necessary for the story of Descent into Avernus, but it has no presence in the other ones. And okay. if we were to allow it mechanically, it would just become an unbalancing element. So, so we could call that like a quest item, almost, if you were using like a video game t- terminology for it, too. Yes. Yep. Quest item, story item. It's all the same language. Absolutely. From a personal standpoint, what do you actually like about the format of Adventures League? Man, uh, portability, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. We have a huge, huge catalog of adventures. And uh, I, mean, I, I do a lot of time with convention support. I travel to a lot of regional shows. Uh, and I, along with uh, Claire Hoffman, the other resource manager, we support events all over the world. So getting people the adventures they want and the stuff that's compelling for them and for their audience is something that I really enjoy. You know, not everyone wants to play the new hot thing. Sometimes they just they really want to live in uh Schultz, right uh, in tomb of annihilation and that storyline as a dm right. that's something they're really excited about so how can i best facilitate them and their events and encourage them to continue to grow even though it's content that a lot of people have already played if their player base is still growing and it's largely due to their passion regarding that story element i want yeah. to support that and that's a big part of what makes me happy with it now, I guess the, the thing that I'm, I'm really interested in is, uh, like, coming from uh, the point of view of playing, like, a home game, the homebrew content, playing on your own, uh, what it's like for somebody who's, who's coming in from there. If I'm only used to home games, what are some of the big differences that I'm going to notice immediately in Adventures League? I think the biggest thing the, the players find is uh, character creation for okay. Adventures League stuff. Uh, we use a, a method called PHB plus one. So that means that the player's handbook is available. And when you create your character, you can take one additional approved resource. So that might be um, Xanathar's Guide. It might be something from Morgan Canaan's Tome of Foe. If it includes those mechanical elements for a certain race that you want to use or a certain class or archetype or something, that becomes your plus one. And as you continue to level up after that, those are the only resources that you can pull your options from. I see. So, that doesn't impact your ability to like use magic items because those are found elsewhere and those are awarded to you by the DM. But when you gain a new level, you choose your resource, you choose your, your new options from your pre pre selected resources. Now, is, is that based on each character having that PHB plus one of their choice, or is it the entire game is PHB plus one collective choice? Uh, every player can select their own plus one resource per character. Okay. Because that makes a big difference if everyone's... Yes. I mean, everyone can pull from different things then, which is really cool because you can build your character mm-hmm. the way you want, which is nice. But I, yep. I think that is really cool because it simplifies it down from 
like what we used to do in three five uh when yeah. I played, which was go, <laughs> cool, so I want oh, where's that feat? Which one of these four hundred uh splat books here has this feat and has this item that I want to take? Yeah, I, I recently found the sorcerer that I played a ton in three five and I looked at it and like the list of feats, the list of spells, I'm like, I don't even know what books these came. I remember <laughs> I had a like I had a truck at the time and I kinda needed the truck to move my character and its books around. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that, that like from from the outsider's point of view, which is usually what I have, that was always really uh, you know, terrifying. Because yeah. I'd see the size of the books, and I'd be like, how many of these do I have to look like? <laughs> at? Oh, right, and, you know, and that's something that we want to be very mindful of. Uh, you know, one of the, the long-running uh, concerns about just Dungeons & Dragons in general was that players some in DM sometimes felt like they had to know all the things from all the books, and, oh, God, there's so many. And that's not the case, especially with Adventures League. Like, you, you swim it down to PHP plus one, and you have these encapsulated adventure experiences. You know, the lore is there for the dm they don't have to read too much outside of it everything like adventure background and lore and all that stuff it's it's easily available sure. so the you can all sit down share an experience at the table and then go about your lives right until you meet again and play your next game we just we didn't want people to feel like they had to own 40 books or memorize these 18 books or you know whatever the previous editions might have given them the impression of Okay. Now, um, if I have a, a new character, I'm completely fresh. I don't know what I'm doing. I sit down at a table. Are people going to explain what's going on to me, or or do I just kind of assume that I'm I'm on the adventure? I'm going. There's a certain uh, assumption as you sit down. Like there are adventure seeds and adventure hooks, story hooks that are given in the beginning, so the DM can okay. kind of weave all those together. Uh, sure. But it kind of comes down to your your group and your own play style. Like okay. I know when I run my group at home. Most of my players, they just buy into the, the shared collective reasoning of, well, this is our adventure day, so I'm just going to do it. Yeah. And other players sometimes might need to be convinced. like They may communicate with their DM and say, like, this is my character, this is my character's background, but this is where they're from. How do I get involved in this current adventure? Right. So the, by combining the tools on the character sheet with the tools that are in the opening of the adventure, the story hooks and such, we should have everything we need to kind of bind all that together pretty efficiently. I wanted to ask a little bit about those uh, those on the fly character choices because um, yeah. because I, I I play a game. I guess my additional resource would be a uh, turtle package because I'm a turtle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that would be mine. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but he has a tendency to get into a whole bunch of trouble. And mm-hmm. and make decisions that are probably not great. When when a character kind of goes off book because they're they're role playing, um, mm-hmm. how how does that get handled at the table? Well, uh, that that is a very common question, right? Like okay. some yeah. players and DMs really want to have that like strictly dictated. Yeah. And my response to it is, you got to talk to your DM. Um, some DMs are not comfortable with going outside the book, like going off the rails. It's just not something they're comfortable with. Some players aren't comfortable being in a heavy role play group. Mm-hmm. Some players aren't comfortable being told, like, "Hey, I, I, I can't role play my character this way." Like, how, how do we meet in the middle on that? And the biggest advice I have is always at the beginning of your session, especially when you're doing like convention games or you're meeting a group for the first time. Talk to your DM and talk to your other players. A, a quick 90-second heads up of like, hey, uh, this is my character name. I play a turtle. I find myself in a lot of trouble because sometimes I make rash decisions. Or if something is green, I always go for the color green, no matter if it's good for me or not. I just love it so much. You know, whatever oh, your, your motivation happens to be, if you communicate yeah, yeah. that in sort of like an out-of-character concept, or a context right at the mm-hmm. beginning, it can help set that tone for the rest of the game. I see. Okay. But it's, man, it's got to be communication. You really got to just take a few seconds, talk to the other people at the table, because we want to share a positive experience. Buy in is one of those things that uh, is sometimes difficult for certain players. And I've definitely run across those groups that have run either like super combat heavy or super role playing Mm -hmm. heavy or a little bit of a mix, which is, it's always interesting with different groups and different play styles, DMs, and players, because getting the right type of buy in. Uh, whereas I've personally, as DM, I've never, ever enjoyed the trope of, oh, you meet in the tavern to get your quest. (laughs) The last time I did that, I had the meet in the tavern and summarily set the tavern on fire on them. 
always beautiful i love it um <laughs> <laughs> that's every tavern experience though <laughs> Yeah. But like it, it's that buy-in that is really important right at the beginning. It's like why are the characters here? Why you know if they want to yeah. just do the whole oh we already know each other and yep. that to me the hardest thing is getting a group of characters to figure out why they know each other, how they get there, or do, are they just meeting? That's the worst for me is when I'm like oh you're all just meeting for the first time and the characters are like oh we don't like each other. I'm like well, well crap. To, to that end, uh, when I run my tables and if I've got time at a convention, I try and do this too. Uh, I'll take a look at everybody that's, that's sitting around me, and you know, as a DM, I just say, "Hey, what's your character name? Give me your background, and what are like two key moments from your adventuring career? Like two big, awesome things. Even at level one, like what incited you to become an adventurer? Like what did you see? What did you experience? By the time we get through all of the players at the table, they can begin forming those." those relationships and it's really cool to watch it just kind of organically happen because you may have like a halfling sitting on your left and a bugbear sitting on your right and if you take them separately you know, like a halfling and a bugbear they would probably never interact but you know the halfling might say like well i was a master chef i was a master baker and then yeah. you know they get around the table and the bugbear's like i'm a competitive eater of course i know this chef so they <laughs> might be from different islands right they might be from different oh. worlds entirely yeah. but by sharing some of your character info your players by way of their characters can begin forming those associations and they build that reality for you it's it's an easy tool that took me a long time to really understand but oh man it's so good <laughs> yeah, i usually end up doing a lot of role playing for my character and mm -hmm. uh, i worry that like i would sit down at the table and that there'd be a bunch of people who are definitely into the crunch and i'd be like oh no <laughs> i am in trouble <laughs> now um do you, do you see that a lot where people where there might be just like one or two people at the table that really just have a specific way of playing and and they have to yes. figure out how to motivate okay, okay. yeah my uh my, my wife is she plays she plays a lot uh she is very combat focused like she doesn't really do a whole lot of the role play stuff she has to be with a trusted group of friends to really relax yeah. and do it um, because she wants to do it really really well and she can already do combat really really well Sure. But then, you know, I've got some other players that maybe they're just joining us for a one-time game or something that, uh, you know, they're completely focused on the role play. So it does become a bit of a juggle where I want to give everyone a little bit of time to shine. Everyone should have a moment to really, you know, to, to be a big damn hero, uh, pardon the expression there, uh, to be a big <laughs> hero at the table. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, uh, right. You know, so as a DM, you kind of got to be mindful of the cues that people are giving you. Sure. So that you can give everyone a chance to really show up and, and be that, that hero, you know? Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. I'm getting the feeling that, like, your wife you've seen in home games and also in Adventures League. Uh, but if you've seen players like that, do you find that there's more of a focus on crunch in Adventures League than in a home game? Or does it really just depend on the person in the group? I think the question of perception really is, as weird as that might sound, if you look at like some of the online communities, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, you sure. see a lot of questions about how does this mechanical thing work? How does this mechanical thing work? How do I, yeah. how do I get a plus 35 on my attack? You know, whatever they're going yeah. for. <laughs> but when you, when you get to the table, in my own experience, the majority of my tables have been more focused on interacting with the story element than defeating the mechanical element. Uh, okay. Sure, we all love to roll dice. I mean, that's why uh, once you've once you've been a tabletop gamer for a while, you may find that you have uh, you know forty steps. Just saying, <laughs> maybe, 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 just maybe. Possibly, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a starter collection. What can forty, say? fifty, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's, it's it's the starter pack, right? Sure. Uh, but once we get to the table, I find that my players, regardless of where I've gone, you know, around the world to to run some of these games, uh, they focus more on the the thematic elements and the narrative elements than just getting to the next fight you know okay. and there are going to be some players who just want to go combat to combat to combat yeah uh, but those are not as commonplace as you might think and as, as commonplace as what the online communities might make it seem so that that was my impression that that it was more combat focused. I definitely think older editions of D and D were a lot yeah. more combat oriented. Three five specifically was very combat heavy. Well, and to be fair, even some of our earlier seasons were more focused on that. And uh, you know that was because at the time our direction. And even if you read like the fifth ed uh, player's handbook and the DMG, 
it doesn't really spend a whole lot of time talking about like ad hoc experience rewards and role play experience rewards. It pretty much says like, hey, experience comes from defeating challenges, and those challenges are in those books defined as defeating creatures, right? Okay. Disarming a trap doesn't necessarily, as per the dungeon master said, doesn't necessarily grant experience, but defeating a dragon does. But as our program has grown and we've seen our players shift, we want to embrace that. So we've we've adjusted the way we're developing our content and the way we're working with our authors to promote that viewpoint to where, you know, people are getting rewarded for the time they're investing in the storyline and in the story objectives rather than the time they're investing in defeating creature X and Y. That's actually something I think Nathan and I have talked about uh, several yes. occasions is uh, experience mm-hmm. role playing. It's a lot harder to agitate uh, the EXP gain from role play because role playing itself doesn't necessarily have a challenge rating like a monster does. So it's right. like, um, and I think we talked about something else like if menial tasks gave XP, then you could just grind those out and just, oh, I'm level 20. What'd you do? Oh, well, I spent <laughs> eight hours baking. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's one of those non-combat. weird things that the non-combat um, stuff is a lot harder to judge the amount of XP that you get for it, uh, yeah. which is, I think, one of those reasons that online, especially, you see people turning to, say, um, milestone type of XP gain or level gain and stuff like that is just, um, it's a different way to gain XP that rewards overall achievement in the story of the game or the character yeah. growth, which is yeah. really interesting. Really, we want people to play the game in the manner that they enjoy, right? We don't want to prescribe a certain method of, of play. We don't want to say, like, you're only going to level if you fight this big thing, because super creative players may decide, like, hey, instead of going to fight that big Dracolich, what if we just collapse the cavern on top of it and then throw a bunch of fireballs in? You're like, right. we're not actually fighting it, but will they defeat it? Well, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, they, they should be rewarded for the time that they invested, the resources they invested, you know, spell slots and, you know, explosives and whatever else. Uh, right. We want people to play the game that they want to play. We want them to do that while still interacting with the story elements that we've given them. And ultimately, much like, much like working in the IT industry, right, as long as you get to the right resolution, you get to the right end point, does it really matter how you get there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the thing that, uh, if, I, if I understand AL uh, and, and the general format is uh, I could move my character's progression from one table to another. Yeah. Like if, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so, how, how does that work? Yeah, I'm trying to just kind of wrap my head around that. Like, So let's cool. say you play a couple of groups or a couple of games with your sure. local group, right? Okay. And then uh, you've got this opportunity to go to Winter Fantasy with us in uh, February. It's sure. Phoenix, Fort Wayne. It's snowy. Why not? You know, it sure. seems like a destination event. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Uh, exactly. So you can take your character from your, your home Adventures League group, your local group. You grab your character sheet. You grab your log sheet. Maybe grab a couple of dice. You get on a plane. You come to Fort Wayne and you sit down. Because you've used the same creation, you've used the same adventure content you can very easily and efficiently jump right in. You don't have to spend a whole lot of time describing to a DM like how you got certain item or how you got access to this race that no one's ever heard of. You're all using the same foundational elements. So it's plug and play. You plug yourself in a seat, you play the game. Perfect. Now, I'm trying to figure out, like... um like uh, from from a player's perspective that's where i'm coming from but if uh, you you know you've run games uh it is it a few. more a few, a few <laughs> just just a few for for you is it difficult is it difficult to run a, a, an al game as opposed to a home game or is it just a different experience for me and like you said i've 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 run a few games uh few. for me the biggest hurdle is just uh encapsulating my experience to like a 4 hour slot right sure i really as a dm i really love to explore background elements and i want to encourage and empower my players to explore those elements as well which sometimes means that my games may go a lot longer yeah Um, Mm -hmm. i i wrote a a horror themed game several years ago uh just this thing trapped under the ice the players get to interact with it and like it's intended for a four to five hour slot but i've run it i rented it uh, for a group in buffalo at one of their shows uh, I think we ran like 16 hours because oh, they just sure. weren't done. 
<laughs> they, they <knew> they getting, <laughs> but they weren't they knew no. they weren't getting extra experience they weren't getting extra gold they just weren't ready to move on there's like there's so yeah. much here and you keep embellishing how far can we go i'm like so you tell me we're done and you stop feeding me drinks <laughs> <laughs> how does a 16 hour session work a, a 16 hour session is uh we cancel a whole lot of plans and yeah. uh we, we moved from the game hall to the uh the, the hotel bar on uh, and when that closed they just let us sit there because we were apparently too nerdy to interact with. So, <laughs> so we were going to tell you to leave, but we're like, oh, they're a little bit too nerdy. Let's just yeah, they're yelling there. at each other and throwing dice. Oh, God, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> we can't do anything about it. Just let it go. Let it go. Just let it go. They're in the corner already. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I was under the impression, like, usually if you're looking at Adventures League games, they're they're relatively short by comparison to what... I would normally play in a home game, right? They're like a few hours. So we design a lot of our content around the four-hour benchmark. We find that four yeah. hours is pretty standard. And honestly, sure. that's been the organized play like benchmark for decades now. Okay. Uh, some of our games we do produce for two-hour content with some optional bonus stuff tacked on so you can expand the game. Um, we've produced them as long as eight hours with bonus content before. Uh, but really, like, that, that, that's been a, a key bit of feedback from our players and DMs over the years. And starting with this current season, season nine, uh, like we give the, the suggested run times and if players run longer, run shorter, like if that's the game they want to play, here you go. We've, we've assigned reward models so that a DM can give more or less based on time invested. And it's as long as it's spent in pursuit of the story objective, we're yeah. going to trust the, the DM to make the right call there. Oh, okay. So it, it it still does, in some ways, come down to story and character development and all those things. You want to still get all those things in. Yeah, yeah. And every group's going to run a little bit differently. You know, if, sure. if a group completes the entire adventure because they have an awesome build and they've got synergy, right, and they complete a four-hour adventure in two and a half hours, oh, okay. Like, they should... <laughs> They should get the rewards. Absolutely, yeah. But there, there's no, there's no real timer that's like, okay, at the at the four hour mark, we are done and deal with it. Those, those are rare. Uh, we, okay. they may pop up a few times in certain okay. adventures. We do have some adventures that are explicitly timed, but those are broadcast up front. We we generally refer to those as our uh, our competitives or our epic adventures, and okay. those those time bound expectations, like it's it's very explicitly spelled out in the adventure like the players have one hour to do this objective right okay so, and those are those are crazy you have an hour to complete the tomb of horrors go <laughs> wow so here's my character sheet and my dice have a day <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh sure that's a, that sounds fun boy yeah that feels like a marathon run i didn't i didn't plan on doing in the game. yeah right yeah, exactly. Um, when you have things like that, are there ways that like Adventures League is able to streamline the process in order to to keep things moving faster than yeah. normal would? Yeah, yeah. So over the last couple of seasons, we've begun including some more visual aids, you know, adventure flowcharts and stuff. Uh, especially for our epics and competitive, like we have to have those visual reminders and annotated breakdowns. Like, hey, at the hour fifteen mark, the event organizer does this. At yeah. the two-hour mark, the event organizer does this. Sure. For standard adventures, uh, we try not to lock it to timeliness. Uh, we'll, mm -hmm. We may put some suggested durations on there just to kind of give a DM it, an idea of like how long a section should take. But it's for standard adventures, it's it's by no means a hard requirement. Sure, sure. But you can kind of get an idea that, like, okay, this is supposed to take, like, half hour, hour to get through this one section, and yep. I, I know I'm going longer than that. Okay, I might have to try to reel this in so that we can... Either reel, maybe reel the players in, or maybe just cut the sure. next experience a little bit short. Like, uh, okay. you know, if if it's a role-play encounter and they, you know, it says it's assumed to take 30 minutes, but they took an hour, yeah. maybe it, it's because they enjoyed it. In that next encounter, if it's combat, maybe consider trimming some hit points or giving the, the characters some extra advantage. Uh, right. Grant them inspiration going in so that they can be big heroes and you know still get the same experience, just maybe not have all the exact same roadmap. Right, right, and that must help with pacing too. Yeah, so yep. that it doesn't doesn't slow down too much. Okay, excellent. Yep. Uh, now, uh, 
I'm used to like playing where everybody levels up at the same time, so I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm fascinated with people being able to move their character between different tables. Mm-hmm. Is it is it tricky if you have a party that has like a high level character and a low level character at the same time? It can be for sure, and that okay. uh, that really comes down to the skill of the DM, and really comes back to what I mentioned earlier. Like you really you got to talk to your players, you got to talk to your DM. Who are you? Like what's your experience? What are some cool things that you've done? Uh, for our hardcover adventures, like you may run into those big level gaps. You know, someone's sure. level eight, someone's level two. Uh, for our organized play adventures, for the, the PDF stuff that we put up through uh, like DM's Guild, uh, we actually write those for specific tiers. So there may still be a gap, but it won't be as large. Like tier one is level one to four. Tier okay. two is level five to ten. So, you know, yeah, there's a power difference at level five okay. and a power difference at level ten. But it's not like putting a 2 and a 10 or a 2 and a 14 together. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was wondering, like, if you can have those scenarios. But I, I would yeah. probably not want to be the level 2 in that scenario anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's an experience, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would think so, because it's still it's going to have to be somewhat challenging for a 14. <laughs> but but yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting for me. Say I, I'm interested in getting into Adventures League, either uh, running or playing. Is there mm-hmm. a process? Is there anything that I have to sign up for in order to, to become part of Adventures League? Or, or no, adve- Adventures League joining is, uh, you, you grab the documentation. We currently have the newest doc on DM's Guild. Uh, you can find the quick link to it on the banner on our site, which is dndadventuresleague.org. Okay. Uh, it's the player and DM pack. It, it, there should be a bunch of links that take you right there. Uh, so the only thing to really sign up for would be like a DM Guild account. Uh, that, and that okay. is because when we release new versions of that documentation, we put it in the same location. Okay. So season after season, you don't have a bunch of different download links to manage. You just download the, the newest version from that same space. Okay. Okay. It's, if, and it's uh, it's free document. Like there's nothing else to it. Okay. Uh, we're looking at some different distribution methods. Nothing I'm quite ready to talk about, but we've got some exciting stuff planned there. Oh, okay. Uh, but there's no like central tracking. In the old days, you had to have like a DCI number and such. Uh, DCI is completely separated. Yeah, I remember that from the my old days of playing Magic: The Gathering. It sounds yeah. like you, you've escaped and are are in the uh, the recovery steps. Uh, I, I, I went from <laughs> Magic the Gathering to Warhammer 40k, so I don't really know. Oh, um, there's a transition. <laughs> the, yeah, it was yeah. transition. But this was, uh, I stopped playing right after Mirrodin Block, so. Okay. I, I played a little bit after that. I was competitive. Uh, I was competitive Magic until shortly after that. And then I uh, picked up like Hordes and War Machine and some more D&D stuff. So yeah. I'm right there with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I I only played played like drafting once or twice, but mostly I just played on my own. I didn't really play competitively when it came to Magic. But I do have boxes of cards sitting around. So, <laughs> so there's one something. Of us. One oh, of us. one of us. <laughs> one of us. Gobble, Google gobble. Um, <laughs> but but like, say I wanted to actually run a game in AL, uh, it, a, a council doesn't come to my door and say you will now go through the, <laughs> you will now no. go through the building process. Okay. No, no, there's, uh, I know some older editions had some like DM certification stuff and DM ranking. We're okay. we are not that formal. We want people to okay. play the game and relax, enjoy it, and just have a great time with your friends. Sure. Um, we're providing the basic documentation. Outside of that, it's your game. It's your world. Build it yeah. and do it as you see fit. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm not necessarily with with my friends, though, in, in an AL format, right? I might sit down with a complete mm-hmm. group of strangers. And hopefully they'll be my friends by the end, but but I it, kind of do. Maybe yeah. maybe for four hours at a time they're friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for short periods of time. It doesn't have to be outside of that, obviously. So some of the new stuff that's been coming out uh for Adventures League, one of the big things I've been hearing about is is seasonality. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, yeah. Uh seasonality is a uh is is a topic that we started exploring earlier this year. Um uh, it has changed quite a bit. So initially uh, we had talked about seasonality being like once you create a character for season nine, like it's only season nine going forward. It, gotcha. it won't be able to play older stuff. Uh, we listened to a lot of uh, fan reaction players, DMs. They they gave a lot of both positives and negatives for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we ultimately decided to not go with that. Now that said, we did manage to uh, we, we did 
managed to include some of the seasonality elements in our current organized play format, uh, sure. meaning that like the the character rewards uh, and, and DM rewards rather are pretty much optimized for running season nine content. You still get stuff for playing your other your other games, uh, but running the the, the current storyline is going to net you some bigger buy-in, some some uh, some of the tastier rewards. Maybe those are just animal companions or an infernal war machine or what oh. have you. DMs that run that content are going to have access to more of those rewards for their own characters more more easily. Okay. Uh, yeah, I want all the pets. If there are yeah. pets available, I will take those. Po- Pokemon's a thing for a reason, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I can make my pets fight each other. That, that's always fun. I think that that's probably more lethal in D&D than Pokemon. But, um... but we do have a Tressum named Slobber Chops, and I love him. <laughs> oh, perfect. Excellent. Excellent. Do, do I have to choose a season for my character? So when you uh, when you create your your character, you you can assign to the the current season if you're just doing hyper relaxed casual stuff at home. Okay. Basically, it's a it's a it's a you do you sort of moment, right? Okay. Um, oh. But we have some additional benefits if you choose to play, say, like a, a tiefling as a uh, it, it's part of the season nine storyline. You assign to that season, and you get a couple of extra benefits. Like it unlocks a couple of extra tiefling powers and wings and all sorts of things. Oh, okay, excellent, excellent. Um, from a from a cosmetic standpoint, too, I, I did want to uh, mention this because, um, like, I, I have my character. My character is a teenage mutant ninja turtle. I, I be, be, because of that, I did go outside of some of the like the cosmetic elements to build my character than they actually list in the book because uh, he's a mutant, so he needs to be seven foot two and he needs to be a thousand pounds and he okay. needs to glow green. Um, but it, it, although that's that, <laughs> but but now technically, you know, that's outside of of the the realm of the character creation for a turtle. But would would they kind of let that slide since it's only cosmetic if I was in Venture League, or would they reel that back in? Like all the DMs that I've talked to, and in my own experience, seeing people at public uh, public spaces, sure, if a player sits down and they they've invested that kind of time and creativity, they're going to let yeah. it ride. Um, yeah. Again, okay. you know, like talk to your DMs up front because they might be like, "Well, seven foot two. Well, today's adventure, like, it's going to be a little more confined than that." Uh, I'm yeah, like, you have to get six feet for this. Is that cool? You know, yeah. that sort of thing. But sure, like cosmetic changes. That's something that our players do quite regularly. You know, they might say like, uh, like in your case, uh, you're you're a teenage mutant ninja turtle, right? Right. Uh, you've got a long sword. Mechanically, it's a long sword, but for you, you might call it a katana. Katanas don't exist in any of the the rule books. I got you. But if you're just like, I have a long sword. I'm using the stats of a long sword. It can be used one or two handed because it's versatile. So can a katana, I call it a katana, but it is just a long term mechanically. Like flavor changes like that, as long as it doesn't change the mechanics, do it up, go nuts. I don't I don't have a katana so much as I have a scimitar, but I can tell you right now that I don't think the scimitar would be uh AL legal. It's it feels too powerful for a regular scimitar. <laughs> um it's like it's okay. like oh it, it does like one D six plus four. And it's it's plus one to uh, to hit, and uh, I'm like level seven. <laughs> so well, I mean, what that sounds like is mechanically, it sounds like yeah. you have a scimitar, right? Yeah, uh, you've got a strength of what eighteen? Oh, I have a strength of twenty. I'm I'm okay. a punch turtle. <laughs> okay, so yeah, got- that's where your plus four is coming from. Maybe. Yeah, so it's actually, actually it good be news is five. it'd be a plus five exactly. Uh, and then if it's a plus one on top of that, you know, because it's a plus one weapon, it's a scimitar plus one, plus your five, so you're actually doing six bonus damage on a hit. I, I, actually, actually, the scimitar itself does plus four, and then I do plus five, so I end up with a plus uh, nine. Okay. <laughs> you see, you see okay, where I'm. Yeah, maybe we should talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, generally you I, don't get plus four weapons, Nathan. That's yeah, that's, yeah. You gotta <laughs> talk to Dom. Hey. You know what? I'm sorry. I killed a Gith Yankee. He had two scimitars. I had two. And oh, then I right, realized right. I'm a monk, so it really doesn't right. mean anything for me right. to have enough. <laughs> isn't, isn't that a really, really pretty silver Gith Yankee scimitar, Nathan? Ooh. It is It is not cursed. I identified it. He said it's not cursed. <laughs> not yeah, cursed. That's a very specific terminology right there. Okay. Not cursed. It is. It is. It sounds like something yeah. I would have written. Yeah. It, it sounds, sounds like something, something I wrote, that, was it? Uh... <laughs> 
Nothing yeah. involving the scimitar has happened to me. I and, mean, and all the other things that happened to me that were negative had nothing to do with the scimitar. I just refuse to tell you anything about Gith Yankee. That's all, Nathan. That's that's perfectly fine. It's probably because, for the best. I mean, if Dom I'm... is using that sword that I think it is, then have fun with that. It does good damage. I, I think uh, I think you I would agree yeah. that the uh, that that sword coming from the Gith Yankee is more fun than anything else I could hear. I think Alan would agree with me. I assume yeah. he knows more about more about Gith Yankee than you do, Nathan. It's guaranteed. You know I, more I, about Gith Yankee. The, the Gith are really cool, but I've kind of I've kind of been playing in the Caius the Worm God space here for a couple of years. So uh, I mean, if we want to talk about worms and undead, I'm your guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, just an, an elevator. If you were to give an elevator pitch to somebody who's like, I like my home games, I like the freeformness of it. If you were to give an elevator pitch to them to say, hey, you should try out Adventures League, what would you tell them? Imagine taking your home game and connecting it with a, a, a shared population of 130,000 other players, right? Sharing that, that game, being able to, wherever you travel, Go to the local game store, go to a local convention, sit down with your character sheet and continue to progress with that same character that you know and love for as long as the game goes on. Oh, yeah, that's a good pitch. We, we didn't even hit floor three and I'm already. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even hit the penthouse. That's good. Uh, I definitely uh, would like to have that kind of experience. I also kind of like the idea, too, that like when it, it can be very difficult getting a group together on a regular basis. But being able to, you know, meet with a group that's that's able to, even though I don't know them personally, does feel nice because I know that I can do that on those nights. Um, and then then the portability, like you were talking before, you, you said that you've run a lot of games. How many games do you estimate you actually have run in Adventures League this year or through the life of the program? Through. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I've got a little one at home. So this year has been, uh, it, it's been a lot more casual. Uh, I haven't done nearly as much travel, but I, I'd say I'm still pushing about 200 games this year. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my busy year is when we launched our author only program. Uh, and that's where I started getting to like the Kaya and worm God stuff. I think that was my busiest one. And I, I ran about 800 tables. That year. Oh boy. Oh, that's a, uh... wow multiple games every day of the year yeah uh, so like when i would travel to go to a convention i'd run 12 to 14 slots uh it just it's a time i didn't have a kid my, my wife and i were you know we were text communicating uh yeah. while we were states apart so like I'd, I'd run three sometimes four games a day uh just so people could kind of get in and see the cool new stuff but uh that, that was my my high end I, i'd say i usually average 250 to 300 Okay. Where can, where can I get in on this so that I can quit my job and play games <laughs> and make and make probably about the same amount, probably more than I'm making now. Actually, if you love ramen and you hate sleep, you too can do. <laughs> <laughs> Good news: I don't sleep and I do buy ramen at work. I uh, get those thirty-six cent uh, ramen yeah. noodles that we sell. Oh, yeah, perfect. Throw it in there with some celery, carrots, and chicken breast. You get yourself a heck of a soup. That's a meal. Yes. That that mm -hmm. that's ramen that eats like a meal right there. Nathan, we need to start producing uh three to four hundred or eight hundred episodes of our podcast a year. There's only so much I could do, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I, there, there's only so much I could do. I would if I could, and if it was feasible, I would do it. But it's feasible. They're just gonna be all live streams. <laughs> They're all just live streams Whoa. now. We're just live stream 24 hours a day. There you go. No, no pressure. No, no pressure. pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Also, no money. So yeah. it's fine. <laughs> but, you know, but you know what? It's just worth it to see me, uh, what I look like after like 70 straight hours on air. <laughs> it's worth it for that. Uh, is there anything coming to Adventures League in the near future that you can tell me about? That, that you I might want, want people to know about, rather. I'm trying to think about how best to phrase this, because... Uh... <laughs> I just had a chat with the boss, and there was a lot of real cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Some things that I can that I can share without getting too far in the weeds here. Internally, we've been talking about our author-only content. We do have some of the admins uh, looking to release some of their older adventures in the next uh, four or so months. So things that we have written previously and haven't been able to publish, you know, for time or licensing or what have you. Okay. We're, we're getting to a point where we can put those out. So those are outside of our normal storylines, but they get into some really cool situations and environments. 
keep an eye on some of the uh, vendors that we've recently added. Not explicitly Adventures League, but uh, uh, if you're familiar with like Beetle and Grimm. Do you know okay. who I'm talking about? Yes, I think I do. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So they do the, the premium boxes. Um, we actually have some Adventures League rewards inside the new box. Um, I actually got to design that stuff. So there's nice. some really cool stuff there. And nice. the future is really bright. The biggest thing I can say, though, is if you have an opportunity to go to a local convention, do it. Yeah. We've got a lot of cool stuff on the, on the fairly near horizon uh, nice. for public play. So even if you can't make it to like Gen Con or Game Hole Con, go to some of the local events that are, okay. are near. And if you're, you know, for people who are listening and are in the U.S., like we've got events all over the place. If you hit our yeah. site, uh, dndadventuresleague.org slash conmap, C-O-N-M-A-P. You can actually see all of the events uh, globally that people have registered on on the site. We've got so much cool stuff coming for the public side of things. Nice. Storyline-wise and just little like player trinket-wise, all sorts of cool stuff. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, now, when you say older adventures, we're not going like way far back, like Temple of Elemental Evil kind of thing. It's It's oh. more recent than that. Right. It's all... From the advent of the fifth edition rule set and okay. Adventures League author only program, these are adventures that only the authors can run. And so far, the uh, the approved authors have been Wizards of the Coast employees and D and D Adventures League administrators. So mm. you know, uh, we may like run custom content that is only something that I can run, or only something that Travis Woodall can run, or yeah. something like uh, we've had Mike Morales run some custom stuff and Perkins. Nice. Some of those uh, some of those adventures are circling back around, and we're looking at actually publishing a few more of those. Um, I think we've got like forty or so in that that basket, uh, but mm. of those four, so far only like eight of them have been published, and there's another batch of mm. eight or so that are coming up here quick. Like when you're looking at stuff that's coming through uh, Unearthed Arcana, like I'm sitting here thinking to myself, yes, I want to be an Arcanist. Yes, I want turrets. Do you ever see those kinds of things coming to a format like Adventures League? Yes and no. So okay. if they become eligible for Adventures League play, they won't be in specifically in that format. Like, okay. uh, you look at Unearthed Arcana as like playtest material, basically. Like, it's, yeah. cool. it's seen some internal playtesting. Now it's ready for the public to check out. If it sure. gets fully approved, uh, you may find that it's in a future source book. Uh, with additional revisions and playtest feedback applied. Okay. And that is where we get into like the PHP plus one stuff. Like, and that's how okay. people would select it. Okay. Uh, like going back, you know, like early on, one of the first uh, Unearthed Arcana uh, add ons was the Artificer. Yeah. And uh, we got Eberron coming. Like the book will be out, I think it's next week. So uh, <laughs> everyone wants to be a Warforged Artificer. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Or a Warforged Druid, because if I see another person at my table named Optimus Primal, I will give them inspiration. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Make me a promise that you only ever give them inspiration if they wild shape into a gorilla. Well, they have to scream roll out, but yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, be I'm thinking Transformers Beast Wars. Yes, yes. absolutely. So oh, yep. he, was the, he was the gorilla in that, so... Yep. You um, don't have to tell me, I know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we're, we're oh I know. We're aware. His, his nickname, their nickname, can be Maximal, yeah, because they weren't the they weren't the Autobots in Beast Wars. That's right. true. They were the Maximals and Predacons. Somebody watched the whole series. Good it was you. terrible, <laughs> terrible CGI. It was really Holy bad crap. CGI, but you know what? It's so endearing. You can't help it. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And the one last thing I have to ask is uh, something that you were mentioning earlier. How do I get a plus 35 on attack? <laughs> you don't, Nathan. That's not statistically <laughs> possible with a rule set. Well, I mean, well, you might be able to, because Wish is a really powerful spell, and it does have a clause for doing things that aren't necessarily in the text. So uh, talk to your DM. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. aside from like a Wish spell... <laughs> Aside from that, you maybe should not be getting that big. Maybe yes. a field trip to Seattle and try and get into the wizard's office and have a meeting with Merkin, uh, with uh, Merles and Perkins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can <laughs> I just get this limited time item that's only available like in one season or one campaign, and right, it just right. happens to be a thirty-five? <laughs> I mean, if I had a meeting with Perkins and Merles, I'd be like, "Listen, guys, 
Time travel. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> sounds like great stuff. I, I I don't know. I don't see time travel happen very often in campaign settings. So I mean, I'm just saying we got uh, we we had a chunk of season eight that dealt with it. You did you? See, I we missed did. that. Okay. So hey, you know they actually did address it, Alex. So what? Well, water deep, time spell port, vampires, beholders, and a little time travel mixed in. Because why not? You you introduce time travel. It just gets better. It's fun. It's fun when you do it really interestingly, though. So I guess I, I guess well, I miss yeah, that. Yeah, you, you do have to. It does have to be interesting. That's kind of like a rule of time travel. Yes, <laughs> time travel can be really mundane, Nathan. I'm like going to the future. The I'm going <laughs> to the future right now. Yeah, you. Well, you are going into the future right now. It's it's, it's called true. time. It's mm-hmm. yeah. We are I'm time traveling travel. in time, Nathan. Traveling outside of the normal time. The time travel we're doing right now is fairly mundane, but you know what the nice thing is? Is that it has not felt nearly as mundane, because Alan Patrick has been with us. <laughs> and and that, that is terrific. Uh, uh, Alan, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, and hey, really giving for us, having me. Yeah, giving us a lot more information about Adventures League. Um, if, uh, if people wanted to find out more information uh, about Adventures League somewhere on the, uh, on the internets, uh, where would you suggest they go for, for more info? Uh, you can check out our site, dndadventuresleague.org, or hit us up on Twitter, at ADV underscore league. Just ping us and say, hey, I want to learn more, and we are happy to fire back a whole bunch of links and get you references. If you tell us where you're at and if you're looking for a game, we might even know a couple of people. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, now, can they find you specifically? Yeah, uh, I have a goofy Twitter handle called uh, Warpliner, W-A-R-F-T-E-I-N-E-R. It is a complete garbage word that means nothing on its own, that's much fine. like a lot of the things that I write. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that, that's okay, because when you're, when you're on Twitter, you can also follow us, and I'm at Citanium. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> which, which is also a garbage word. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's from Psychonauts. It's a thing. It's, it's yeah, a real most thing. People, it's garbage. It's a thing. He wrote it. It's on the internet. It must be real. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. You can also follow me. I'm at EXP Limited, and our show is at Delve Podcast. Not, not, not nonsense words. Those actually mean something. Those, those are yeah. word things. Yeah, those, those are abbreviations. Those, those, those are words. Those are real. They are powerful words. <laughs> they are powerful words. They're not necessarily wish, but they're powerful <laughs> words. Um, <laughs> You can use those words to fight a terrorist. You'll fail, but you can use them. <laughs> Alex, if they wanted to find out more information about Delve, if they wanted to wish their, their way to more Delve content, where could they go online? You can go to delvecast.com. Perfect. And uh, make sure to click on our Patreon banner and check out our Patreon content for, you know, the rough cut interviews and all of that good stuff over there. Make sure to follow us on iTunes, Google Play. And basically, if there's a podcast app, we're on it. Uh, Spotify, <laughs> iHeartRadio, every, every place where podcasts exist, we exist. Even in markets I didn't know were real. I, I keep getting notifications that one of our podcasts is on Hubhopper in Asia, and I didn't even know it existed, and it's apparently one of the biggest things in the world. Uh, awesome. So, yeah. So, I, so, do they have analytics, though? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> really? If only, they, if only somebody had analytics, that would be good. Um, <laughs> but make sure you check us out all of uh, those places. I like stars. That's how you do a wish for me. <laughs> you give mm-hmm. me all the stars. Again, I want to thank Alan Patrick for being on. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to us. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, Alex, you're all set to be on an adventure now. Yeah, I I need to try and get not sleep time. <laughs> well, well, that's a different spell, Alex. I I need to spell. I need to stop sleeping during daytime hours and be able to like actually play a game now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would that would be good. Then you can go would, on an adventure too. It, it would be it'd be great if I only had time. Well, you know, I hear that time travels make it a comeback. He <laughs> could make this work for you. Perfect. Anywho, the time traveling sleepy people over here are going to <laughs> are going to go away. Thank you all for joining us here on Delph. We will see you on the next one. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>